Keep your Bibles open to Exodus chapter 34 as we will go back there. And um, <clears throat> that is the, um, the center of our study for today. So, but before, we, um, before I continue, would you please bow your heads one last time as we have a moment of prayer. Father God, your people are here. And as always, they're here because they want to have an encounter with you. They're here. We're all here because we want to worship you. And we are ready to listen, O oh God. So come, let your spirit come to us in, the, in our midst, in our hearts, and give us, O oh God, what we are longing, longing to hear. Feed us, fill us with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. All week long, I had been transfixed. Watching the news on my um, iPhone, following the... Um, the tragedy that's unfolding over there in, in Europe, the largest, as it was already uh, mentioned today uh, by Dave, the largest land war in Europe that has seen in times past two world wars starting there. It's been over 70 years since uh, a war of that magnitude has erupted in, in Europe. And now what we have there is... Um, a situation where two cousin peoples who both uh, peoples um, freely admit come from the same roots, fighting each other to the death. It's a matter of uh, an invasion, I, in my opinion, as uh, the politics of man fails and the humanity of man fails. It's what happens, I suppose, when we spend too much time in the valleys of this world and not enough time looking up and perhaps spending more time up the mountain of God. This had not been the first time Moses climbed the mountain of God, as we read here in Exodus chapter 34. The first time uh, Moses climbed up the mountain perhaps was uh, when he um, received his commission from God to leave the land of Midian where he had spent about 40 years of his life as a shepherd to go back and to rescue God's people in the valleys of Egypt. It was on that mountain where um, Moses saw the burning bush. And it was there on that mountain where, where, where Moses found his calling from God. And the second time he was up that mountain was when he received the ten words, as the uh, Hebrew scriptures tell us, or what we know today as we call as the Ten Commandments. He went up that mountain and he spent a whole lot of time there alone with God and, and um, he came down that mountain and whatever it was that God wanted him to do, he failed, he lost his temper. And in fact, if we read just a couple of um, chapters before our chapter for today, which is chapter 34, you will see that story unfolding before our eyes, and you know the story well, I'm sure, or at least most of us do. When Moses spent too much time up that mountain of God, and then people down in the valley, down below, were getting nervous and anxious, is he ever going to come back? He's spending too much time up there with God. Is there, any, is there ever a case in which we could spend too much time with God? And yet those that are in the valleys of this world seem to think that, it, that there is such a thing as too much time spending with God. And so we find as we get to of chapter 32 of Exodus, we find this surreal situation where those people that had been left in the valleys of the world turn to their gods for some kind of respite, for some kind of release rather than turning to God. 
And Moses, who had been spending a whole lot of time, too much time, some, some would say, too much time he spent, he's been up there for God knows how long. How long? And the people down below were murmuring and grumbling, and he's never coming back. He's never coming back. And then they took to reveling and turning to their own desires and their own passions. And our story tells us there in Exodus chapter 32 that when um, Moses and his assistant, his trusty assistant who was always by his side, who always wanted to be where Moses was, spending time up there with him, his name is, you know him, Joshua. There's rumblings down below and, and then... And then they mistook that rumbling as uh, rumblings of war. And, 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 and then Joshua or Moses said, that's not the rumblings of war. It's something else. And so Moses and Joshua, having spent so much time up there on the mountain of God, they started, you know, to come down, to go down the mountain, bearing the two tablets of stones, the Ten Commandments, the very covenant of God to his people. And by the way, it's not a case of the first four over here and the last six over here. It's two sets of ten written back and front and back to commemorate or to drive the point that this is now a covenant between God and, 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 and Israel and that each one gets to have a slab as a commemoration of their covenant with each other. You could just see Moses coming down the mountain, bearing those two slabs of stone, stones, and we're told that uh, God himself with his own fingers wrote on those stones the ten words that would govern the life of his people forever. And when Moses comes down, having spent days, perhaps several weeks, we don't exactly know, up there on that mountain, and he sees this reveling, and he sees that golden calf down below. He lost it. He lost it, and then he threw those slabs of stones, two slabs of stones, down to where the reveling was, consuming everyone in sight. That was the second time Moses went up the mountain as we know it. And when he came down and failed in his desire to change the world below. How do you change? How do you have moments where you can probably we, you can actually change the world around you? When you can transform the world around you, it seems like the world, every time we think that the world has, you know, turned a good corner and, you know, up to brighter, up, uh, you know, up to brighter sunlit land, we see or we hear of news, we see news such as what's happening now there in Europe. You know, I, um, I should probably, you know, my wife counsels me not to watch the news too much because it's um, really having an effect on me uh, because I could see the faces of these people just a, you know, a while ago I, was, uh, I saw the news of ordinary people m women, mainly women, old men women putting together Molotov cocktails you know what Molotov cocktails are? they're homemade bombs Because there, you know, the you know these Russian forces are coming near and near uh, to their to their homes, to their cities, and they have no other means of defending themselves. And you know, push comes to shove, they will defend themselves. They say, and they're making these homemade bombs. As the, their enemies approach in their tanks and their whatever it is, and as I listen. To the news, and I saw those people. You know, I, I, you know, something. A part of me, a part of me, ached, and a part of me bled 
And a part of me is sad because people are dying in that part of the world for lack of a vision of God. When we think about transfiguration, which is what happens here to Moses in this story, when Moses' face, when Moses spends so much time with God, he becomes transfigured. There's only, there, there's only, are only two instances in the whole scripture where this happens. And we know the other one. It's found in Luke chapter 9. There in Luke chapter 9, we find a, a similar scenario where, where Jesus Christ spends the nights up on a mountaintop with several of his disciples. And there in, in, in Luke chapter 9, we find that Jesus Christ's face was transfigured. He became this glowing person. You know, the, the glory of the righteousness of Jesus Christ and his, and his divinity shone right all around all around them, and, and, and Peter and James and John, they were so taken by this transformative experience, they were so taken by it that they wanted to stay up there and never come down the mountain. You've read that story before, I'm sure. It's found there in Luke chapter 9. From verse 28 of that chapter, it says, Now about eight days after... These sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up on a mountain to pray, on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, and appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake... They saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. And as he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And as a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. How do we affect transformation? How do we, of course, we're not expecting that there would be a repeat of this kind of transfiguration. It only happened twice in the history of, of, you know, of, of Scripture, in this history of humanity. It happened during the time of Moses. It happened with Moses. And with Jesus Christ, who now becomes the new Moses for all of us. And we are tempted to think that transfiguration is only something that is physical, that only happened to these two individuals. When in fact, the lessons before us here is so pertinent as to say that you and I can also have our own moments of transfiguration before the Lord. When true transformation happens... And when that transformation spreads from us to others around us. And the lesson is very simple from today's scripture. What does it take for this transformation, for this transfiguration to happen? Well, it requires, first of all, a mountaintop experience, just like Moses had. Just like what Jesus Christ had. Is it too much for us to imagine that we could spend endless amount of time with the Lord? Is it too much for us to imagine that the saying truly is true, that by constant beholding, we become changed? Are we spending enough time with the Lord? Are we having those mountaintop experiences with the Lord? Or are we too busy with life down in the valleys? Pursuing the things that we love best. Moses, the third time he went up that mountain, according to our scripture, was there for 40 days and 40 nights. And in fact, our text even tells us that he was up there and he ate nothing and he drank nothing for 40 days and 40 nights. We find the same story, by the way, when Jesus Christ started his ministry. When he was... 
in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, and he ate nothing, and he also drank nothing, and he was sustained by the presence of God. And that closeness that Jesus Christ and Moses had with God sustained him to the point where we are told that his face started to glow because he had been talking with God for that long a time. Can we bring ourselves to imagine that we too, somehow in some spiritual way, could also spend that much time with God to the point where we are transformed in the inner life so that people could see around us that we are glowing because we are, have been in the presence of God. What would it take for us to be transformed in such a way that we would glow before others so that when we pass by, they, you, people could see, people could sense that there's something different about us, something transformative about us, whatever we might call that to be. Perhaps in the way we conduct ourselves before others, perhaps in the way in which this, the, the, the fruit of the Spirit is exhibited in our lives, something happens when we find ourselves spending a lot of time with God. We become transformed by the sheer presence of the one whom we behold, who we, be, we behold. But as our story tells us, Moses as Jesus did as well, came down the mountain. They never stayed up there in the mountain. Yes, of course, I could just imagine Moses wanting to stay there and never come down. Of course, you know, that's kind of creative license here. I'm not, we're not seeing that in, in, in Scripture. Moses, we're never told that Moses um, lingered up there for four days and four nights because he didn't want to come down. But I, my imagination just, you know, gets the better of me sometimes, and I don't, I don't think it would be uh, too much of a stretch to imagine, to imagine Moses as well, not wanting to leave the presence of God. What would it be like to live our lives always in the presence of God? Moses spent 40 days and 40 nights there. He lingered the third time he was up there. And of course, this time around, when he comes down, once again, the Lord gave him a second chance. He, he blew it the first time when he threw those two slabs of stones. Second time around, it was a success. He came down, and he came down with those two slabs of stones as God's directions for life as it should be the transformed life of his people that it should be from then on. And then we are told that his, his face shone like the sun, that he had to cover his face. What does it take to transform not just yourself, to be transformed yourself, but to transform others? Well, it would take for you as well not only to spend time with God, but to come down from that mountain in order to be useful where you are, to be useful where you live. And that is precisely what Moses did. Yes, of course, he had to cover his face from time to time so that people could not, you know, could, could bear the sight of him glowing. But yet he came down. And coming down, he was patient with the people and he communicated the will of God to the people around him every day throughout the remainder of his life. Which is something that initially um, Peter and James and John in Luke chapter 9 did not understand. They thought that, you know, well, you know, um, here we are. How good it would be to just uh, stay here. How good it would be to just come to church and then go home and the rest of the week. We have done nothing for God. Peter, I, you know, I, sometimes I wonder, uh, sometimes, you know, my imagination gets the better of me sometimes. I wonder if Peter were alive today and he were to, to read scriptures that talk a lot about him and what he did and, and, and how he bungled things, um, you know, how, you know, 
um, I, I wonder sometimes what, what, what Peter would, would, would say about, you know, what he was like before he became truly transformed. He did not want to leave the mountaintop. Everybody cannot live on a mountaintop experience all the time. We have to come down the mountain. And like Moses, we have to come down and tell others what God has given us and what God has shown us. And to transform the world by our, by our actions as God has shown us what to do. It's really very simple. And I could wish that more people around the world, not just us here who spend Sabbath worshiping together, but a lot more people all over the world could spend more time or would spend more time with God and to be transformed by His sheer presence so that when they come down the mountaintop experience with God, they can transform the world for the better instead of seeing all these destruction and hearing all this destruction around us, all these wars and all these fights that really start from the hearts of those people who have lived all their lives in the valleys, not knowing, not having seen, not having experienced the presence of God in their lives. I could wish that the leaders of the world would spend more time up on that mountain and to come down that mountain bringing the order of God and the love of God to those around them. And I could wish the same thing for all of us individually and for all of us as a church family. Yes, we, can, we too can have our moments of transfiguration. This did not only belong to Moses or to Jesus. It can be you and me as well. Let us pray. Father God, we long for the transformation from the inside out. Lord, help us in spite of ourselves. Sometimes, often times, we feel like we don't want to spend time with you. But you're always there, always open for us to come your way. And here we are, oh God, we are here because we want to be transformed by you and being transformed by you to be also your instruments in transforming the world around us that there will be a lot less hatred a lot less wars within and wars without transform us O oh God let us have moments of transfiguration that Moses had and our Lord had with you in Jesus name Amen.